IG, where we stream live all the time. It's 8 o'clock on a Wednesday night. You're listening to Out of Our Minds Poetry Radio, the longest-running poetry radio show in the United States. I'm here with a couple of guests. Um, can I test your mic? Test, test. <laughs> Hi, Rochelle. Hey. And uh, <laughs> test. <laughs> one more test. <laughs> How are you doing there on that mic? Great, I think. All right, good. Uh, so you're here listening to Out of Our Minds Poetry Radio. I'm your host, Rochelle Escamilla, a.k.a. Poetita. And I'm here in the house with super exciting people. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Kimmy Martinez, you uh, work uh, with Cinequest. That's right. Yes, this is our third year of doing Poets in Film um, at the Cinequest Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And we are so excited to have a guest poet, um, Dana Joya. Yeah, who's here? Dana Joya, yes. welcome to KKUP. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Well, um, so you're kind of, you're, you, you've been here before. You've been doing Cinequest. I have. Thank you, you for <laughs> welcoming me back. Yes, I love it here, Michelle. I love talking to you. Um, so, so what's going on at Cinequest? It's in full swing, right? It started? Oh, or? it is. Bill Nighy is actually on stage right now at the California Theater. So they had a full crowd. You know, they always have a whole line wrapping around uh, uh you know, First Street there. But um, yeah, so Poets and Film will be at the Hammer Theater this year, Thursday night mm -hmm. at 7.15 p.m. Mm -hmm. And we have some incredible poet performers. Mm -hmm. So these are perf uh, poet poets that perform their poetry and then we have a great band rebels camp it's a local band mm -hmm. that does funk funkadelic nice yeah and um they will be um in the um uh, working with the poets when they are reciting their poetry mm -hmm. or performing their poetry. And then uh, we have some uh, films, short films, three short films. That uh, are also about poetry. That's right. They're poetry films. Mm -hmm. So uh, one is by Ma Mike Joya, mm -hmm. who uh, has founded Blank Verse Films. Mm -hmm. And another wow. is by yeah, Stabby Doll Media, mm -hmm. uh, which is my yeah, film which company. Is yours. I'm very which is yours. excited about it. And then we have one by... Um, Perez, mm -hmm. uh, David Perez. Okay. And he's worked with the content magazine with this um, uh, film that we're going to be showing. Right. And David Perez was a laureate in That's Santa Clara right. County. Right. The house is full of laureates. Well, uh, yeah. you know, we have Mighty Mike McGee, who's oh, the right. Santa Clara poet he is laureate. The current. He's the current one right now, and he's mm -hmm. going to be. Um, performing nice and uh you know i'm so honored to have you here dana joya who okay, should i read i'm gonna read your bio i shouldn't say should i read your bio i'll read your bio <laughs> uh dana joya is an internationally acclaimed and award-winning poet uh former chairman of the national endowment for the arts joya is a native californian of italian and mexican descent he received a ba and an mba from stanford university and an ma in comparative literature from harvard university plus a ton of other things that you've done over time <laughs> so welcome i've been around a long time <laughs> yeah so i i mean i find it uh, i mean particularly interesting to connect with you about uh your mother was a chicana yeah and you grew up in la grew up in hawthorne was where's that <laughs> south Bank, right by the la airport mm. so you know i right in the direct flight path of LAX. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was mostly a Mexican neighborhood. If you weren't Mexican, you were probably Sicilian and related to me. <laughs> so it was, you know, there were these two cultures. <laughs> That's great. My daughter, my husband's half Italian and I'm Chicana, so our daughter's <laughs> the same No, mix. it is. It, we, they mix well. <laughs> you know, Latins, the Latins mix well, but they argue a lot. <laughs> I, I had a... Uh, you know, a household in which the volume was always turned up. Oh, yeah. But my mother, you know, was a working class Mexican woman, not much education, but she loved poetry. Mm. You know, she was, had gone to school at a, at a time when they had people memorize poems. And she had a, a childhood of truly brutal in every sense of the mm. word poverty. Her mother mm. died when she was a little girl. And... The poems became very important to her. And when I, you know, uh, was growing up, she would always recite poems to me. And I, that what that taught me was something that my formal education at Stanford and Harvard tried to convince me was wrong. Oh. Uh, at Harvard and Stanford, I was taught that people didn't like poetry. Poetry was the art of the intellectual. <laughs> you had to be very smart and, and uh, sophisticated to uh, appreciate poetry. Mm -hmm. But I was grown 
in, in a group among people for whom poetry was one of life's pleasures, like song, like sports, like gambling. Uh, mm-hmm. This was something you did to have fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, nobody, uh, I was the first person in my family had went to college. I mean, nobody mm-hmm. had education. And so that is, uh, has been really a guiding principle you know, for me, which is that poetry should reach out to people. It should expand its audience, not restrict it. Absolutely. I mean, that that's coming from a similar background. I mean, my mom was a teen mom. She had me when she was 17 mm-hmm. out in San Benito County. And we didn't have poetry. Po- poetry wasn't formal, but um, we had a lot of storytelling, mm-hmm. ghost stories. We're talking yeah. about a, a that poem. That was my childhood ghosts. too, yeah. Rochelle. A lot of storytelling. <laughs> a lot of storytelling. Mm-hmm. It's an oral, an oral culture. You know, people speak and listen and, and it's communal. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's communal. And that has sort of like um, sort of morphed into your positions all over the United States. But as a California Poet Laureate, you uh, started a program is like Poetry Out Loud. Yeah. When I was at the National Endowment for the Arts, which at that point was, a, you know, it's the official arts agency of the United States. And it was in the process of being, you know, shut down by the government and people wanted to eradicate it. And I was brought in to save it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm happy to say that I was able to raise the budget every year. In fact, even Great. now I've been out of office for 10 years. They haven't raised the budget ab- above where you know mm-hmm. it was on my last year. Mm-hmm. But we want to, to do programs. And this is something not, not everybody may agree with me on this. But mm-hmm. I think the role of something like the NEA is to bring out the best art possible in a way which reaches the most people yes. possible. Mm. If you bring great art and just bring it to a small elite subculture, which mm-hmm. is what happened right. a lot yes. of uh, during a lot of NEA's history, you know, you're, you're bringing coals to Newcastle, as they right. say. You know, these people don't need the subsidies. In the same way, if you take mediocre things and you bring them, uh, you know, to you know people that are disadvantaged, you're insulting them. You know, you, mm-hmm, I, I believe mm-hmm, we should mm-hmm. never condescend, mm. you know, to people. We should, in a sense, realize that everyone is capable of responding to great art, to real art. Uh, everyone has a creative capacity. And so, you know, what we began to do is to try to make these large programs that reached millions of people. And one of them, which was our, our first national arts education program, was Poetry Out Loud, mm-hmm. which is a national uh, poetry recitation contest for high school students, and uh, since you know it's run on a you know tiny budget, but we reach uh, we've probably had five million high school students wow. participate in it, so it's had a really uh, sizable impact in American poetry. Absolutely. I mean, even now, um, I think there was just an article published on uh, poetryfoundation.org by an author, um, Lupe Mendez out of he's actually a pressmate of mine at Willow Books and he is a teacher in Texas and he wrote this article basically saying that poetry has to be included in middle school and high school education specifically around the Latinx and the Chicanx struggle if you're serving a Hispanic Institute because um, these students need to have a form of expression. They need to understand that there are ways in which they can use language which they don't always have a good grasp of um, they need to be able to manipulate language. And when they learn how to manipulate language, they learn language. And poetry is a more fun way of doing that than grammar. Uh, <laughs> and, you, know, you, you can learn all the grammar you need by you know reading real poetry and reciting poetry. And what, what I think uh, an education by poetry, to use a term that Robert Frost uh, mm. you know, coined, uh, does three things. First of all, it improves your power of articulation, your ability to express yourself. Secondly, by learning and performing great language, you know, you expand your vocabulary, you expand, you know, uh, your your mental uh, capacity to speak and to listen. But the third thing is it does is it by inhabiting these tremendously powerful emotional vessels, these things that are created to carry uh, largely emotional, imaginative uh, messages, Mm -hmm. you increase your capacity to listen, to hear what other people are saying, to understand that everybody has a kind of secret life inside of themselves that they're trying to articulate. And you can't jump to assumptions about people, Mm. you know, and it creates a kind of empathetic power. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, Monday I'm going to be in Sacramento for the state finals of poetry. <laughs> uh, I believe we now have it in all 58 counties. We're the, wow. we're the biggest uh, uh, state in the country in terms of participation. And, you know, we have, you know, 40, 50,000 kids who participate every year. Wow. And they are terrific when you see them at the state level. Wow. I can only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. I mean, I think about the students I teach over at CSU Monterey Bay and, you know, they'll walk into a class and uh, they'll write their first poem for me. Mm. And, you know, you, you get just regular poems, but then you get a couple of them that are just poets. And you're just, you feel like it's a curse and a blessing. Yeah, no, it is. It is. <laughs> As the father of two sons who want to be artists, I mean, I, you, know, they, you know, I keep telling them, don't do this unless you know what you're getting into. Uh, but I'll tell you something about Poetry Out Loud that I think is really gratifying. If you look at the people who win the state and national finals, mm-hmm. they are disproportionately, in fact, overwhelmingly first generation Americans. Hmm. These are people yeah. you know, who have come here and they are going to master and command mm. the English language. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I mean, and that's, we were just, my students and I were just having a conversation about this, about the sort of um, the issues of being a first generation Ameri- a U- United States person, American, whatever we want to, whichever term is correct. Um, and how sort of language is such a contentious point for our for our people because our immigrant parents don't want us to learn the language of their immigrant culture necessarily because they want us to assimilate into American culture and to learn English perfectly and so we have sort of this this passive deletion of culture um, through language and so I think the ability for students to connect through poetry and then to go into English is a really important part. But there's a lot of traumatic experiences around language and the loss of language in our country. No, it is. And I think, you know, that the parents, they want you to, to succeed. They want you to be a part of this new world, but they, they also want you to be rooted where you come from. And I think that that's a challenge for everybody. I think Americans, you know, have to sort of work towards our common future Mm -hmm. without losing where we come from. And I've always really felt that, you know, fundamentally as a writer, as a critic, I am a working class Latin kid from LA. Mm. Uh, I'm the first person in my family who had the privilege of going to college. Mm. I'm the first person, I think in my family who had the privilege of actually doing what he wanted Mm. with at least part of his adult life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't take that for granted. So you've got to do it in a way which honors everybody who got you there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, that's a really great way to put it. Um, and I, I want to say that that we also have in the studio uh, Alan Saldovsky, who was one of the uh, the teachers who both cursed and blessed me <laughs> at San Jose State. Alan, do you want to come to the mic? <laughs> Um, I, I was in Alan Saldovsky's poetry class and, and I wrote a poem for him and he said to me, do you know you're a poet? And I said, what? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, there's a certain kind of temperament that goes along with um, having access to language. Mm. And uh, people on the radio have that. And poets are, uh, poetry is a really great medium for radio. <laughs> And it's a, it's a radio, pretty good medium for film, too. Radio is the greatest literary electronic medium because it's all language and, yeah. and music. I mean, you can go back and listen to W.B. Yeats's recordings for the BBC if wow. you could get a hold of them. Yeah. So hopefully this I is being archived. I rise and go now <laughs> and go good. to Innis Free. Yeah. Well, apparently radio is having a big, big comeback. You know, we're getting a little popular, and KKUP has been around since uh, it was in a garage in the '70s out in Cupertino. So we've been here the whole time when it went up and down and back up again. Well, poetry is having a tremendous revival. Yeah, I don't think uh, most people understand uh, what's going on. The audience for poetry among the young has doubled Mm. in the last five years. It's the fastest growing art in the United States. Mm. The total audience has grown by about 67% in in five years. And so there's something about our moment right now, Mm. which is about spoken language Mm. and sound and poetry. And and the vehicle for it 
for spoken language is in podcasts, mm. is on community radio stations. Everyone's listening to NPR, something. NPR. And in film. And in film. <laughs> I mean, and video. You, po- poets, po- a, po- a poem that that's done in a video. I mean, if you've got a book, you've got to have a book trailer, right? I'll, t- I'll, tell, I'll give you your, your listeners a challenge. <laughs> you cannot watch two hours of serious TV anymore without hearing poetry quoted at least once. <laughs> uh, it's true of TV shows. Oh. It's true of movies. People don't believe me, but you know, you'll do it. And there's something about right now that, you know, that, that even the people that are creating this new electronic culture, mm-hmm. they want to give, both give themselves a credibility and also sort of uh, revel in language, mm-hmm. uh, you know, by, by quoting poetry. I mean, it's, it's everything from uh, supernatural to mm-hmm. Victoria, you know, I mean, uh, it's every kind of show. And, you know, and, and you know, and I, I try to copy them all down because I'm trying to keep a log of it. I can't sit down because every time I sit down, suddenly it comes up again, you know, and I have to go back and write it down, you know. Why do you think that is, Dana? I think that Good it's, question. Uh, I, th- I think our literary culture is in jeopardy right now. Mm. I think it's very serious. Yes. If you look at this, theater is dying. You know, mm. musical is really healthy, but spoken theater is really in trouble right now. The audience has been, you know, cut in half over about twenty years. People are reading fewer novels. Yeah. Uh, people's basic reading ability, unfortunately, is you know, we is drifting down again. Mm-hmm. Uh, poetry remains the one really vital um, and accessible literary art Mm -hmm. we see it in hip-hop we see it in cowboy poetry we see Mm -hmm. it in slams we see it in poetry recitation and i think that writers you know the writers of television the writers of movies uh they sense this too and so they're they're in a sense in their way participating Mm -hmm. in it uh it's astonishing how many movies have been made about poets you know lately Mm -hmm. from neruda you know uh, to Mm -hmm. keats to elizabeth bishop uh, and bukowski right yeah. yeah and Really? Patterson, the new film yeah. by oh, Jim Jarmusch. You know, know. Yeah, know. Uh, Bukowski. I mean, there's, wow. there's, you know, all sorts of these, these things, and it's because the, and it, people uh, will probably not believe me, but if they think about it, I think it's ponderable. One of the things that makes poetry really attractive, really credible. Is that nobody makes any money off it? it you know, <laughs> yeah, and no, we laugh yes. at that, but it, no, it's, yes. it lives. We, you know, we're in a culture right now, a society in which everything is for sale. Yes. we're dominated by huge global corporations, which right. are trying. You know, you can't watch anything without ads popping up. Right. They're trying, even in schools, you know, the, the corporations are trying to own every moment of our conscious time mm-hmm. by advertising mm-hmm. or selling us something. And poetry exists outside the commercial marketplace so you may say well you know alan's poem is absolutely terrible uh or dana's poem is absolutely (laughs) awful but there's something honest about it there's something he it was not written for money it was written because the person's trying to articulate uh something real and and i think people are drawn to it for its authenticity and its energy so so my question is how does it keep supporting itself i mean presses like gray wolf Copper Canyon, some mm. of the mainstay presses need funding from foundations, but they also need f- the s- support of your old group, the National Endowment for the Earth. Yeah, no, it's all that money is important. But if, if you've ever read the Divine Comedy, mm-hmm. the very end of the Divine Comedy, when Dante's in heaven and he mm-hmm. gets this vision of how the universe works, mm-hmm. he goes, "Love <laughs> that moves the sun and stars." Mm. And poetry is is supported by those who love it. Mm. They can love it institutionally with checks, but it, mm-hmm. people people start reading series, they start presses, they start magazines. They do this thing because they love it, and they also recognize in their own life how powerful poetry has been informing them. I think that's what my mother did. My mother had just a terrible, terrible life. But poetry was something that she could hold on to, uh, which in a sense brought her in contact with her best self, her best vision of life. You know, and a, a lot of it was embodied in, you know, it was many and many a year ago in a kingdom <laughs> by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know. By you know the these older Lily, poems. Yeah. But it gave her a vessel that was strong enough to hold the powerful and troubled emotions of her own life. And I think people, 
have these life-changing experiences through poetry, and they want to return the love. So how did it happen to you? Through your mother? Yeah, I think it happened through my mother. And when I was in eighth grade, um, Sister Mary Damien, uh, St. Joseph's uh, uh, parish uh, you know, in Hawthorne, said, you seem to be intelligent, but I can't understand a word you say. And so she kept me and four other boys after class, and she gave us a lesson every day in elocution. Now, wow. it was only when I was about 50 I realized, what do we all have in common? We all work from, you know, from houses where English was not necessarily the language. Mm-hmm. We were, you know, we were all Latins. Mm-hmm. And she took us and she made us memorize poems and recite poems and work on our elocution. That cha- so it was the love that my mother gave me and it was the power of articulation that this feisty little French Canadian nun <laughs> gave me changed my life. Right. Enlarged my life in ways that I, as an eighth grader, could not even begin to predict. And I I think that's one of the common threads with a lot of the people that I know that love poetry, which is that something happened at some point and it had to do with the poem. And that one moment convinced them that poetry was the answer. (laughs) So I can ask Rochelle, when did that happen for you? You know... (laughs) Thanks, Alan. The, the, the answer is when I met you, Alan. <laughs> well, of no, course, Alan, but, but, uh, but I think it happened before but, but she I, met me. <laughs> but I think there's something to be said about the, the second language learner. I, I spoke Spanish first and um, and then English later, and my there was a lot of um, mistranslations or miscommunications or Spanglish or things that didn't quite translate between English and Spanish. And my mom was very sing-songy and playful with a lot of those things. So instead of making fun of us for someone would maybe out in public would make fun of us for saying something incorrectly, and then we'd go home and continue it and keep saying it and joke around about it. And I think that's why I love the language movement so much when you taught me about the language movement, because I liked that playfulness. But I, I think it came from the home. And for me, I mean... There were times we didn't have food on the table. There were times that I didn't have a place to live. And we always had a library. So we always went to the library. I always had a book. What I find that's interesting is that you re- re- you responded to Elizabeth Bishop. Oh, I love it. And her. Dana, you got to work with Elizabeth, yeah, Elizabeth Bishop. Yeah, Elizabeth Bishop was my teacher. Gosh. Oh, my gosh. So that's sort of something we all have in common is <laughs> admiration and love for Elizabeth Bishop. Oh. But that's so different than what I was expecting you <laughs> to like. <laughs> I was I was really excited when you said, "Oh, this is wonderful poetry." And Dana, you met her as an undergraduate, right? No, as a graduate. As student, a graduate, I, student. I was in her class. But you know, wow. Elizabeth Bishop had the upper class version of your childhood. You know, she <laughs> lost her parents. She was always homeless. She was moving from place to place. You know, she had enough to eat, but she never had people that loved her. Mm. You know, and it's that that placelessness, that mm. permanent state of homelessness that goes across, you know, an emotional home. You know, that goes throughout her poetry, which I think is one of the things that makes it so powerful. Mm, absolutely. How about you, Alan? I was a student at a, uh, a lab school in Iowa City, Iowa, mm-hmm. and poets visited at our school. And suddenly I, I was in, uh, listening to a poem by a, a poet named Jim Moore, James Moore, who's a great wolf poet. Um, and he uh, read some Gary Snyder at his <laughs> presentation. And it really resonated for me. It was probably the poem "Hay for, Hay for the Horses," <laughs> Snyder's working class. And I'm I'm from an academic class, mm. but that poem was in such plain language, and it was so clear, and the words were so so precise. Maximum information, minimum syllables is what mm. Ginsburg would say. That it just it it just haunted me mm-hmm. to be able to put something together like that. Plus, I enjoyed Ferlinghetti's humorous poems, mm-hmm. like Underwear, which was fun to read to teachers. He's turning 100 years old next he year. He is in March. He's having a party for him. I yeah. know. So, I mean, California has been, a, especially the Bay Area, has been a real mecca mm-hmm. for poets. Um, it's been a, uh, since, the, since before the Beat era, it was a mecca in the, in the time of the Wobblies and Kenneth Rexroth in the mm-hmm. 20s and 30s. Um, and before that, it was the Barbary Coast, right, Dina? Yeah, no, it was San Francisco, and I think now all of California, has always been you know, the other literary uh, region for the United States. There's, it's the 
northeast and then conversing with the, with the west coast and we don't mm-hmm. behave ourselves <laughs> no we they don't. don't really like <laughs> us you know uh, you know and they feel very nervous but i think you know california increasingly represents the future mm-hmm. so I mean, how did how did you feel as an eastern and living in the east it's kind of an exile for all for a number of decades trying to be a poet when you were actually employed by uh, a, a, f- a large corporate well, entity. Well, I had a very simple problem. People f- find my life complicated because I, <laughs> I'm always moving around. I'm always doing things. But my mm-hmm. life is very simple. I'm a kid from a poor family who wanted to be a poet, and I had to make a living. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I made you. a living in, in numerous ways. I worked in business. I worked as a journalist. I worked uh, running the NEA. Recent years, I've uh, taught part time, but you know it was whatever worked at that f- phase of my life. And you know, one thing that was essential for me, and I really, I give this advice to people: there's some people listening tonight that have very good jobs that want to be a writer, and they're imprisoned by their success. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are times in your life you got to walk away from success, mm-hmm. you know. And I was, you know, in business, I was finally after 15 years making a very good salary, and I realized that it, if I was going to make a, be a full time writer, this was the time I should quit. And I just quit. I had no job. I had no income. My wife, God bless her, didn't divorce me. <laughs> uh, and for a year, I made nothing. Yeah. I made nothing. Uh, but then, you know, we gradually put together, you know, a life and. Within a couple of years, I was making a, a you know, a, 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 you know, a good living as a full-time writer, and so you can do these things. But you know, what happens is that most people are afraid to lose anything. Yeah. And so if you become too afraid of losing anything, and uh, you can't get anything new, it's even true as style. You can mm-hmm. write a certain kind of poem, a certain kind of thing. You write it well, and you're, you don't want to try anything else because you maybe it won't work as well as this. And you, there's times when you just gotta have to take a risk. Yeah. But you maintained your identity as a West Coast well, poet all the way through. When I was, the years I lived in the East, every vacation, uh, every holiday, I went back to my, my, and moved with my parents. Mm. So, I mean, there was never a period of more than a couple of months that I wasn't here. Mm. And I, al- I always thought of myself. I went, when I went to New York for the first time, I, my wife and I, my girlfriend then, said we were going to stay there for three years. Well, you know, uh, but we ended up staying almost 20. Wow. But, you know, we can't, we always thought of ourselves as cowboy, and I always knew I would go back. And finally I realized in order to go back, I had to quit. So I just, you know, mm. you know I just quit all my jobs and, and moved back once again to California with, with no source of, you know, I had a BBC job that I quit right. and these things like that. But it was, this is where I wanted to be. And also, I had two kids. I had my first son died in infancy i lost our mm. uh you know my first boy i had two other boys and we were they were being raised in the east and they were being raised in kind of a middle class life and i felt that they had didn't know their roots mm. and I, I wanted them to know that they had come from sort of poor working class latin catholics yeah you know this is a very it's a very yeah. culture so we just moved out, uh, and I moved a couple miles away from my parents were, yeah. and we started over. And once again, my life resumed itself. But I, did, you know, I think if I hadn't done that, I was so much a, po- you know, at that point I was such a poetry insider in New York. I mean, mm-hmm. it was everybody wanted me in all the com- prize committees and uh, introducing people, and people were asking me to read here and write there. It was very gratifying, but by walking away from it. I think I got more distance and more objectivity on the on the poetry world, and with it m- on myself as an artist. And I it brought me back to my my human roots. And I think as a result of that, I wrote better. Mm. Uh, in the same way, I mean, uh, I you know I had a very successful life, and then my son died suddenly, mm. and nothing I had really mattered then, mm. because you know I realized what mattered to me was my family, my art. And my sense of my own life as a spiritual journey. Mm. It had nothing to do with how much money I made or anything else. And and by having all that destroyed, uh, to a certain degree, I saw things clearly. Yeah. I, I mean, that that's an amazing journey. And I, I mean, it makes me think about how 
displacement and not being able to place yourself like Elizabeth Bishop in my own story. And even in my career as a poet, you know, someone says, oh, will you come to China and start this creative writing program in English at the university? And I, that drop of the hat, my husband, who's an amazing soul as well, was like, well, yeah, let's go. Let's yeah. go. Let's move everything to China. And then when, <laughs> when my book gets launched, she's like, I was like, I think we need to go back to the U.S. We have, we have to save up three months salary yeah. to get a plane ticket. And he says, all right, well, let's move back to the U.S. And it was always that place that displacement and actually my poetry is always looking back at the places where I was in a space of sort of longing and distance and for me that feeds the poetry whereas right now now that things are getting settled and I don't know what's happening I'm, I'm feeling flatlined for my poetry yeah, yeah. well no I mean <laughs> We, we live in a culture where everybody's too busy too much of the mm. time, too many distractions. And a lot of times you just have to give things up. You have to mm. sort of renounce things just to clear enough space to be able to think well and to mm. see well. Mm. That's great. That's great. Thank you. That, that's amazing to hear. Um, will you read some poetry for well, let me, us? If I, let me read a really short poem. Sure. Since I was talking about the death of my son. Mm. Um, my son died at four months of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and I wrote a lot of poems about that experience, but the poem I want to read is a little different. It's about if you lose a child, it's really strange. It's a kind of phantom life your child has from the, ever thereafter when you see a kid that would be about the same age as your son. Uh, you say, that's what my son would be doing. Mm. That's what he'd be lo looking like. And, and it goes on for years, and you, mm. sort, and you sort of see your, your child and other people's children. When my son turned 20, what would have been his 21st birthday, I wrote this poem. It's called Majority, in the sense of legal majority. Mm -hmm. Now you'd be three, I said to myself, seeing a child born the same summer as you. Now you'd be five, or seven, or ten. I watched you grow in other bodies. Mm -hmm. leaping into a pool, all laughter, or frowning over a keyboard, but mostly just standing, taller each time. How splendid your most mundane actions seemed in these joyful proxies. I often held back tears. Now you are twenty-one. Finally, it makes sense that you have moved away into your own afterlife. <sighs> you know, so you know, that's, I think it's an experience that unfortunately many people have shared, you know, where you do it. And I never heard, see anybody articulate about that. Do you want another poem? Or yeah, I, yes, I'll, please. I'll maybe do a, a, one other short poem. And then we can get back to our delightful chit chat. <laughs> uh, th this is a, I just finished doing an album of jazz songs with this wonderful pianist named Helen Sung. Uh, she, she's given actually the, the album a great title, Sung with Words. Mm, yes, uh, I have it right and, here. Uh, and so I've written you know, poems and lyrics for her. And this was the first one I, I, I wrote. It's a poem about the beautiful people. I mean, it's a, very much of an L.A. poem about mm -hmm. the beautiful people and the power that beauty uh, gives them and what happens to that power. It's called Pity the Beautiful. <laughs> Pity the beautiful, the dolls and the dishes, the babes with big daddies granting their wishes. Pity the pretty boys, the hunks and Apollos, the golden lads whom success always follows, the hotties, the knockouts, the tens out of ten, the drop-dead gorgeous, the great leading men. Pity the faded, the bloated, the blousy, the paunchy Adonis whose luck's gone lousy. Pity the gods, no longer divine. Pity the night. The stars lose their shine. Wow. Wow, that's great. 
I'm uh, I'm gonna let I'm gonna gonna require my students to listen to this podcast afterwards so they can hear the uh, sonic value of the poem, as uh, Sam Maya would say. Yeah. <laughs> well, a poem should be fun to say. Yeah, it should feel good in your mouth. That's what Robert Frost said, right? It's yeah. all 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 the funs and how you say a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's what Frost absolutely. said. Absolutely, I'm gonna put the CD in for at the end of the show. I'll play a few poems yeah. uh, from from this album. Um, but, uh, will you remind us, Kimmy, uh, what's going on again? We are going to have some information about the Cinequest poets, uh, performing. Yes, that's right. Uh, poets and film tomorrow yeah. night, uh, Thursday at the hammer theater. It's at seven fifteen, Um, and we will have eight poet performers, mm -hmm. um, which means that they'll be performing their poems. <laughs> right. Um, and we will have a live band, Rebels Camp, which is a local uh, great band. Um, they do funkadelic and <laughs> psychedelic. And <laughs> Sounds great. <art> rock. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, we will also have three films, uh, three short poetry films, one by Mike Joya the other by Savvy Doll Media. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Mike Joya's uh, uh, film company is Blank Verse Films. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and one by David Perez. Right. And so this is not just poets reading their poetry on stage. This no, is, they this are is performing something different their also. poetry. So you'll have costume. Mm. I'll be in costume. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Others will too. <laughs> Dana, are you um, going to be in costume? <laughs> yeah, you can be in costume. <laughs> Some people say just the way I dress. <laughs> Can you dance? Too? Do some dance. In the old days. In the old days. <laughs> so yeah, there'll be some dance, and you know, so just we're just gonna have fun, mm. and um, yeah. So I mean, tickets will be available. Oh, you know that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we're so gonna... it's tomorrow night. Yes. Tomorrow's Thursday. Yes. Okay, and people can get tickets to this on CineQuest.com. Yes, yes, they can. Okay, mm -hmm. great. That's okay. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for being on the show. Oh, thank you, Rochelle. And next always, year, always a pleasure. Hopefully, so maybe you, you can ring me into this. <laughs> yes, yes. I've been trying. Next year, so all right. Get a film with you in it. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But thank you so much. Um, for those of you listening, you're listening to KKUP Cupertino 91.5 FM here in the Bay Area and beyond the Bay at KKUP.org, where we stream live all the time from San Jose to Monterey. Um, so this is Out of Our Minds Poetry Radio. I'm your host, Rochelle Escamilla, a.k.a. Poetita. And I'm here with Dana Joya, who was the Poet Laureate of California. And lots of other amazing things, including the child of Chicanos. Did you ever identify as Chicano? Well, it was... I identified as, as being Latin, mm. you know, which is, mm. you, know, the, you know, because, you know, especially when you go to school with the Irish, you know, you, know, you, you got to have some defense there, you know. But I was always a little bit of an outsider because my dad was the only person in this family who married somebody who wasn't Sicilian oh. you know and my mother married an Italian you mm. know so there were these two cultures that were there and we were the meeting point <laughs> but I, I think it's a very American situation right you know where you're you know you're uh, the t the archetypal American existential situation <laughs> is that you're something that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> you know, you, your life has to bring it into fruition. Mm. You know, and so, and so it was interesting, sort of mediated between these two very different cultures. Uh, my neighborhood was pretty much a Mexican neighborhood, mm -hmm. so all my friends were Mexican. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we were there, but, you know, then we went, you know, there was also, you know, around us and the larger thing was, you know, you know, especially the Catholic thing was a lot of Irish, you know, and so that was a totally different culture, you know, and it wasn't, you know, and those two are, you know, that's much more foreign, you know, yes. than, than you, you, know, you think. These are people that, you know, uh, when you go to dinner at an Irish house versus an Italian house or a Mexican house, mm -hmm. you know, you could be on another planet. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is different. My husband is half Irish, but also half 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 uh, Italian, so he's yeah. got or, those two. Yeah. Or the he's way that the, those two. the Irish, you know, the Irish just, you know, speak back to their parents and you know, yeah. oh, yeah. man, you know when we, i just said man if i talk to my mother that way oh, I, you yeah. know i'm gonna i duck oh know? yeah oh yeah <laughs> but anyway it was you know. that's great Mom to have that to experience one look. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay well i mean you know i mean these are these are important i think these are becoming increasingly um important questions for for poets who are emerging in the world people are really trying to understand their identity, identity in the American culture. let me give you yes. a, a, something else and once again 
you never hear this, but it's, you know, I think it's very essential. Um, if you are speaking English in New England <laughs> and you're reading poetry in New England, mm. the winters are white. <laughs> the summers are green. Mm. Uh, the towns are called New Haven. Mm -hmm. You know, they're called, you know, Woodside. If you're in California, you have a different natural rhythm. You know, the, the winter, I mean, look at outside the window right now. Everything is greener than Ireland. Mm. You know, the summers are brown. And we have, uh, when people came to California, they found things that didn't exist in England or New England. Mm. And they had to find words for them. And guess what? <laughs> the Spanish had words for them already, or then the uh, California Indians had mm -hmm, words for it. Mm -hmm. So there's these giant trees called sequoias. Mm -hmm. These kind of, you know, these, uh, you know, these, you know, these strange, lovely, delicious things called abalone. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that you would eat. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's arroyos. You know, there's, mm -hmm. and uh, there are these things that aren't really farm where there is cattle called ranchos, mm. you know? And so suddenly all of these words entered in. Our towns are named Sacramento, San Bernardino, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're, yeah. you, know, we're our, our, you know, we're named after the saints of heaven and the mm. angels. Uh, and so if you are raised in California, your English is already permeated with Spanish, mm. uh, and, and a little bit of touch of you know of of it of sort of the, the the you know the Aboriginal you know residents of California, these hundreds of tribes of Indians with their own languages, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we speak a la an, uh, a language which has never existed in English before, and we're describing a seasons and a landscape that doesn't doesn't exist in England or New England. And so there's a sense of excitement, I think, about being in California. And it's, you cannot separate it from our Spanish, Hispanic heritage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great way to put it. Absolutely. I mean, you're from San Benito County. <laughs> I am from San yeah, Benito County. And, and it's come, and it even takes a kind of joke thing. When they had a second plant uh, for Standard Oil, what do they call it? El Segundo. You know, <laughs> you know, and the people think that's a Spanish. You know, you, you know, it's like you know, when I was reading, we, we, you know, with all my Mexican friends, they would say, "Hey, he's El Chipo." You know? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know, and, you, know, you know, kind of all this kind of this, you know, Spanglish. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. And that's very, you know, and that's very California. Yeah, yeah, it is very yeah. California. Yeah. And uh, and when you leave California, you don't realize how much of a California accent you have uh -huh. when you yes. go to the east. When I was in Pittsburgh, people were like, "You're from California." We speak. <laughs> I am? We speak the pure English. <laughs> <laughs> Although my Chinese students said my 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 language was very clear, so because that might say well, something. We have the advantage in California because all over the world they're watching police shows filmed in Los Angeles. <laughs> so everybody recognizes our accent. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, uh, will you read us out with a couple of poems and then we'll finish the show? Well, let me read a poem. Um, it's. I think it's a fun poem. It's a. It's a sort of a story poem, but I thought it would be appropriate for the film festival. Uh, it's called Film Noir, mm, and it um, sort of replicates a film noir plot. It takes place in basically a small town in the Central Valley. It's a farm town in the August heat, with a couple of bars along Main Street. A jukebox moans from an open door, where a bored waiter sweeps the floor. A bus pulls up by Imperial Fruit. A guy gets out in a new prison suit. He's not bad looking, medium height, full of ambition, not too bright. He's a low life, he's one of the lost, who's burnt every bridge he's ever crossed. Just out of the slammer, a ticking bomb, the wrath of God and kingdom come. It's the long odds for a roll of the dice, for big stakes you can't beat twice. The cards get dealt, the wheel spins. At the end of the night, the house always wins. <laughs> he sees her alone at the end of the bar, smoking and hot like a fallen star. Mm. She's a cold beauty with a knowing wink. If she shot you dead, she'd finish your drink. <laughs> Some guys learn from their mistakes, but all he's learned is to raise the stakes. There's something he forgot in jail, that the females deadlier 
than the male. It's tough love from a hard blue flame, and you can't beat a pro at her own game. It's the long con, it's the old switcheroo. You think you're a player, but the mark is you. She's married but lonely, she wishes she could. Watch your hands. Oh, that feels good. <laughs> she whispers how much she needs a man. If only he'd help her. She has a plan. Their eyes meet and he can tell it's going to be fun, but won't end well. He hears her plot with growing unease. She strokes his cheek and he agrees. <laughs> it's a straight shot. It's an easy kill. If he doesn't help her, some other guy will. It's a sleek piece with only one slug. Spin the chambers and give it a tug. The heat of her lips, the silk of her skin. His body ignites. He pushes in. They lie in the dark under the fan. A sex-drunk chump. A girl. <laughs> with a plan. <laughs> That's great. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you thank you so much for being on the show, Dana. I really oh, it's appreciate it. Such this. fun. <laughs> great. Kimmy, thank you for being here once again. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh Poets and Film will be tomorrow night for Cinequest. Uh where is the location of Hammer Theater? At the year. Hammer Theater. Great and at acoustics. what time? What, what time again? <laughs> it's at seven fifteen. All right, seven fifteen. So uh can people pick up tickets at the door? Yes, they can at the box office right there at ha Hammer Theater. Great. Well uh I hope you guys tune in over there and uh thank you again dana for being on the show alan thanks for being on the show um i'm going to play us out with uh actually a song and uh, i'll come back later and play a track from your cd so tell me again before we leave tell me what this cd is this is a, a cd of, of jazz songs that i wrote the lyrics for with mm -hmm. the pianist helen sung and uh, and her um in her band okay great well thank you so much i'm i think i'll actually play this first as we leave the studio and then i'll come back and uh and talk to you more listening on the radio so here we go this is kkup cupertino 91.5 fm thanks for listening i'll be back uh next week with another poet so here we go here's some poetry for you meet me at the lighthouse in hermosa beach that shabby nightclub on its foggy pier Let's aim for the summer of 71, when all our friends were young and immortal. I'll pick up the cover charge, find us a table, and order a round of their watery drinks. Let's savor the smoke of that sinister century, perfume of tobacco in the tangy salt air. The crowd will be quiet. Only ghosts at the bar. So you, old friend, won't feel out of place. Time and tide are counting the beats. Meet me at the lighthouse.